Hi, my name is Mike Morrison, and welcome tonight. And what I'll be presenting to you is um, we've called this uh, the pot, the plot. It's about composting, and it's also about growing plants in small pots. Um, I have a background in composting, which is about 40 years old, and I've been a little bit out of touch with it for the last few years. But I've developed up a number of composting technologies. I'm an inventor; it's my main role, and I developed a thing called the Aero Bin, and this is the next generation of composter. Um, with most composting systems, the, the, the challenge is always to get the air into the bin. And a lot of people don't realise that everybody turns their compost, but these microbes, the compost is made up of bacteria and microbes and fungi. And they all live in a harmonious kind of relationship. And when we turn them, we start to break up all those colonies and they interrelate. The mycelium that are in there, the, the mushrooms and the fungi, they all have root systems that are very, very fine. They go right down into the deep sub-layers of soil. And when we turn it, we break all of those systems up and they have to recolonize and re-establish themselves. So there's a lot of advantage in actually setting your compost bin up so that you don't do a lot of turning. And in order to do that, we need to have a few little tricks that allow us to simulate what nature does. So when compost is made in nature, uh, the, the, the typical thing is that you'll have a tree and it's got branches and it's got leaves and underneath you've got the, the soil. And what happens is the leaves all drop to the ground and birds come and roost in, in the tree so you get all the droppings from the mm -hmm. birds and you get all the leaves and they build up in a layer and that layer usually is not terribly deep. It's also partially sheltered from, from the sunlight, so it's, it's got a nice humid area that's not drying out too much. So this is just the perfect condition, and that's sort of a relationship with the soil that the tree has and with nature. And so when we make our compost, what we tend to do is we tend to make it in a big pile, and we go away from this sort of concept. So it be becomes an issue that you have a lot of material on top, it compacts the material at the bottom, and it becomes hard for the material to breathe. And in this area here, if you go in and have a look, you'll find that there are chewing insects, there's worms, there's, there's all sorts of living organisms in that area because it's, it's lightly packed together and there's lots of little tunnels and places for them to live and colonise and do their thing. So we want to try and simulate that in a vertical pile because we want to do it in a concentrated area. So what uh, the other part of this is that when we make compost, you have a lot of runoff. There's a lot of water that leaches out of your compost bin. And if you do that on the grass, you lose the advantage of all of this liquid that's coming out. So my thoughts, this workshop is really about us getting together and sharing our knowledge. So what okay. I've done is I've come up with this concept and I'm not professing to know everything there is to know about all these areas because it's a very deep subject. But what, what we want to do is to get everybody thinking about how they can extend and just use one simple uh, process to extend out into a lot more var variations. So um, the ideal place to make your compost bin is to take a garden plot and to put small compost bins, not, not large compost bins, and there's some very clever ones that are coming out now that go down into the soil and they have holes in the side. Yeah, I've seen a PVC tube. Yes. It has yeah. holes in it and you put your compost in it and that's supposed to get the worms. Well, they're great. The only thing is it's a bit hard to retrieve your compost if you want to use it for other things. Yeah. And the other part of it is that you, you're putting a lot of your compost fairly low down in the soil. Mm -hmm. So it's going a little bit below the root zone. Yeah, so you're not really getting good utilisation of it. So what we've done is I'll show you a, what we've called the biofuel cell, which is a complete concept. And we've, we've made that so that it's above ground. And you can set it into the ground a little bit if you want to. But that means that the worms and everything are up on the level where the roots are for the plant. So the worms will carry these nutrients across. And you find that the plants that you grow around the bin mm -hmm. are very lush. And you lush. get a bit of a, an angle like that where you get really lush growth and it, as it gets further away it sort of it, it gets less lush. But the idea of this is that you can have small bins, you can have multiples of them. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that um, when I first started my composting project it was around um, kitchen waste. Yep. Because kitchen waste goes into our, our rubbish bin and it makes it putrific, and it makes it very smelly, and it means that you have to collect the rubbish very frequently. If you didn't have that in the rubbish bin, you could collect fortnightly, and there's a whole mm. lot of ramifications of that. Now, kitchen scraps are about the best material you could make compost from. Because when we're eating, we're trying to eat a wide variety of food, because we know that if we've got a wide variety of food, we've got more chance of getting mm -hmm. all the 
trace elements and minerals and all the things we need to build our body. Yep. And the same thing happens in the soil. If you have a wide variety of nutrient going in, you've got a, a, a big broad base of feedstock to feed your plants. Mm -hmm. So you can guarantee that your plants have got really good nutrient. So kitchen scraps are a great thing to make your compost from. They tend to be a little bit strong in nitrogen. They have a bit too much nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And typically what people will do is they'll layer their compost bin and they'll put in leaves and kitchen scraps and grass. Grass and beans and bit of dirt. Bit of horse manure and yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah. A lot of people don't have the time to do that. Yeah. And they want something that's really quick and easy that they can just go and put their material into the bin and just leave it. it. Just leave it. So we're going to take this concept, which is the biofuel cell, and we're going to put it into the garden plot and we're going to concentrate on composting kitchen scraps. Now the best material to put with your kitchen scraps is a little bit of cardboard and newspaper. Yep. So... All the paper you get to get in the Yeah, all that sort of thing. Like that. Yeah, yeah, tissues are okay. Toilet rolls. Yeah. Anything that hasn't got a lot of printing on it yeah. or colours and things yeah, like that. So, so just basic cardboard, recycled newspaper mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. Um, the actual device that we've called the biofuel cell is mm -hmm. very, very simple. It's a bit like a hair clip. Yeah. And what it is, is it's a piece of core fruit. It's got a slot down the side. And we put them into this format. And we have a container. Now, in this case, we've made a special container up. But it doesn't mean to say that you have to use this container because what we're about is using things that are around the house right. and looking at economics and how mm -hmm. can we use this concept. So the fundamental thing is that this is the biofuel cell. Right. And what it does is it allows penetration of air. Okay. So what we do is we have a unit like this and we've placed one of these on the side wall. Side, yep. So that you can see there that that runs down the side. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it goes right to the bottom yes. and we place one of these on the ground underneath and let it protrude. So what happens is the air can get in from underneath right. and it can go up and down this ladder yes. and it can diffuse the air out across the right. container. And then what we do is we have uh, smaller units which go inside and they go up and down. As the okay. compost sinks, mm -hmm. these go up and down and they pick up air from the side unit and it travels across and it diffuses into the compost. You just have one of those in the centre that you place about every three or four inches, you'll place one of these on and that'll actually diffuse the air through the right. material. Now, So there could be several of them? Yeah, there could be office. eight or ten of those. Uh -huh. And um, what you've actually done is when you put the kitchen scraps in, they'll get hot really quick. Yeah. So you've actually started a pumping action because the hot air rises. So as yeah. the hot air rises, it activates all of air. this. Yeah, and so it will start drawing the other air from the bottom. Yeah, it's very powerful. Mm. And then the other thing that happens is there's a lot of heavy gases that are produced. Right. And those gases will flow down and they'll flow yeah. out. And that's why you keep the opening at the bottom so that yeah. the gases you don't want in the bin can get out yeah, and can okay. escape. Yeah. So that is fine. Yes, yes. So um, basically it's just a question of getting your kitchen scraps and pouring them in putting one of these on top and then what I do is I, I put a layer of cardboard or newspaper. Mm -hmm. Another material that's really great to use in the garden. Like a layer, how much of a cow? Um, well, you could, you could just put one sheet of cardboard. All right. And, and what you can do is you can take a sheet of cardboard that right. size yep. and punch two or three holes in it. Okay, so the air, so the air can still keep moving up. Okay. And what that does is the layer of material underneath, as the steam starts rising, it condenses on here. Right. So that it never dries out. Yeah. yeah. Because the two reasons that you have to turn your compost, one is because they dry out, yeah. and the other one is because they starve of oxygen. Yeah. So by having this here, each layer is, is not going to lose its water. Right. So you could be putting in um, scraps of cardboard mm -hmm. and newspaper and you put it in a layer. And that's where you get insects coming through. Yeah, and you get insects coming moving. through. And the worms actually go into this um, core fluid and cardboard and you find that the, the preference, the worms, is the cardboard. They'll go to where it needs it first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I do with mine, with the actual, with this unit here, I just have one of these yeah. and I sit it on top. Oh. And it's got holes in the middle, so mm -hmm. water will flow out to the outside mm -hmm. edge where it can draw back in like a sponge. A yeah. little bit of water goes through the middle. But that goes up and down with it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's good about this is that it's right on on the compost layer. Right. 
if you have it that far up, the heat will rise off the top layer of your compost and your top layer of compost won't work very fast. Right. Because it cools down. But if you put this right on top, yeah, the heat's trapped in there yeah. and it makes it work much quicker. Mm -hmm. And the newspaper does the same if you put newspaper on top. On top, yeah. It'll trap the heat. And the biochar does the same because it's very insulating. It's mm -hmm. an extremely good insulator. Now, another material that is really fantastic to use is a thing called biochar. Right. And this is becoming more and more popular. People, you can actually make it in your own fireplace at home. Oh, okay. You can take your twigs and leaves and you can get a good fire going and put yep. plenty of them on and let it burn up. Yep. And then you just wet it down and you'll end up with biochar. Okay, so what's the difference between that and normal ash or that that you would, uh, charcoal that you would get in the bottom of your This is actually place. carbon. Right. What you get is you get... Um, uh, potash, yes. which is very good very for the garden, garden as well, yeah. but it's more concentrated, so it's okay. it's a lot of the concentrates. Right. Whereas this one is carbon. This is what we call carbon sequestration. You know, they talk about it, where you yeah, where you, carbon when you burn where the tree, the you know, comes, yeah. and, and it gets stored in the at, in the, in the ground rather yeah. than in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So the roots of the plants become carbon in the soil, but with this material, yes. with this material, it will last for a long time. Right. It can last for hundreds of years okay. in that format. But what's great about it is that it has little holes and cavities in it. It's like a sponge, and it holds four times the amount of water that soil does. Oh, okay. And all the bacteria and fungi and everything love this material because they've got structure that they build around. Okay. And the nutrient from all of the um, liquids that are running off will be stored in this. Into that. And, and they yeah. can become like a little factory that keeps processing oh, okay. it. And there's a, there's a, a thing called grey soil. Right. which is from the Amazon and it's very interesting if you want to have a read of that sometime because it's called terra preta soil and the early civilizations in the Amazon region they supported large amounts of life and they, their agriculture was based on carbon on, mm -hmm. on a biochar and in recent times they made more fertile soil than we we're able to make today and mm -hmm. the soil was able to regenerate itself and terra preta soil is, is the most fertile gardening system in the world and it's very ancient and they've that's, been trying to recover the knowledge the from it. Yeah. Mm. So it's worth a read. Yeah. But th that's a great material to make. Okay. So you can just have a, you know, when you're cleaning up and you're burning your leaves off, yep. don't let them burn right through to the end. Just right. throw some water over it. Okay. And it doesn't matter if some of it's a bit woody. Right. But so long as you've, you've got some biochar in there yeah. and that's a great material to sprinkle so, up. So it's sort of only half burn it. Yeah, okay. yeah. In fact, you, you know, if, if at the end of a really hot fire, if you get a really hot fire and you've got twigs in there, yeah. you'll find that uh, it quite a, it, it's a bit of an art form. You know, yeah. you can actually get it to a stage where you have a lot more char than wood left in your fire. Yeah. So, and, and now you can start to buy it. There are people that are making oh, it. Oh, yeah. So. You tried it, huh? Yeah. 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 So, it's a great concept. Now, you don't have to use this container. You can just take a, a 20 litre pail. Yep. You can leave it with the bottom on if you want to. Mm -hmm. And if you leave it on with the bottom on, you can put it up on bricks right. so that you've got it raised up. Okay. And how I do mine is I just bore four holes that are a little ways up, about an inch up from the bottom, yep. and one that's right on the bottom. Okay. And the liquid drains out of there so you don't end up staining on your concrete. Yep. And the beauty of that is that the liquid that drains off it's full of all the bacteria. So, so you drain that straight onto your garden? Well, well, you can do two things. One is you can pour it back over the top. Right. And it'll, re it'll increase the number of bacteria mm -hmm. and fungi and everything in your compost bin and it'll speed up your process okay. for making compost. And another little device, our mission here is to create a community activity and to raise funds for community houses like this group that we've got mm -hmm. here and um, also to teach children how to do gardening, it's a simple little concept. And so we've got a number of things that we're actually looking at marketing and this is another little invention, it's called a biofork. Okay. And it's, it's actually, when you've got them, they yes. are fantastic All because right. they'll, they'll move into compost and you can actually go in and turn, uh, okay. you can get in and, and it'll go penetrate through really, right, yeah. this is actually compost that's been yeah. working for a little while and you can mm. see it. it's already mm. started to break down, Something's the worms are starting to get into it. In and so that's all ready, and that's yep. got some newspaper laid right. on it. Yep. Shredded paper. Yep. And then what we're ready to do is to place another one of these on top, yeah. and we'll bring in some more compost, and then we'll put either some biochar or some more newspaper on top, and we'll keep layering up. Mm -hmm. And it's surprising how much material you can actually get into a container that size. Mm. 
you can actually get about 50, 60 kilos of material, even more. Because it's broken down. That's right. Mm. Now, um, once you've made, everybody says, well, okay, I'm going to make all this compost, what am I going to do with it? Well, if you make it this way and you just leave that container set aside, it'll actually turn into beautiful soil. And I've got some in here. This is one that we made earlier. And the condition of that compost is such that you can actually grow your plant straight in that container. Mm -hmm. You can actually grow it in the container that you've made the compost. So you can oh, have these right. pots yes, yes. and you can just plant them from the top straight of them. Into them. Yep. And, um, so it's not going to be too rich that it would burn? No, no. So long, as, so long as you leave it for long enough. You leave it for about six months. Yep. And because it's had a lot of heat in it, and because it's pretty rich, mm. it really makes the compost uh, pretty fast. Mm. So once you've, um, once you've got it to that stage, what I like to do is I like to um, get just wood chip, and, uh, and I actually compost wood chip, just mm -hmm. uh, with the leaves, you know, wood chip yep. with the leaves in it, yep. and I'll actually put some in a container like that and use the same principle, mm -hmm. and compost it up, put a bit of kitchen scrap with it, and you end up with a material like this. Like a so it becomes like a polymix, but what you do is you put that on top of the soil. Right. And that so stops that all your weeds. It becomes a weed barrier. Oh, okay. And it stops the water drying out, it stops your soil drying out on top. So you can sprinkle that over the top and you have your plant growing underneath it in the in the compost and in the soil. So you can take any sort of a container. I just took a polystyrene tub mm -hmm. and um, coated it with a bit of render and the children can cover them up and have fun. Paint them? Yeah. And what, uh -huh. I also, what I also do is I take um, a drinking container, just put a pinhole in the bottom, yeah. and I, I poke it down a little ways, about four or five inches down, and I just water through that. Oh, okay, very easy. And what that does is it ensures, because when you water from the top, yeah. you find that um, the water doesn't penetrate down into where the root ball is. You want that water down where the root mm -hmm. ball is. So by having a container like that, you can actually get the water to go below the surface. And you're not putting a lot of water on the top of the ground where you're encouraging weeds and seeds to grow up. Right. So you keep the surface a little bit dry. But when you scrape back the wood chip, you'll find that just immediately under the wood chip, it's really dry. It's really moist. Yeah. And it's a lovely biology yeah. taking place. Talking a little bit more about the biofall, um, the beauty of it as a tool is you can do a lot of different types of weeding and hoeing of the ground. You can actually dig quite big holes in it. But the big plus about this is it doesn't kill worms. Oh, okay. So it penetrates into the soil. Yep. And, you know, if you're working through compost, you can actually pick things out if you want to. Oh, okay. It's like actually, a pair of tongs. It's like a pair of tongs. So it's a very versatile oh. little tool. Mm -hmm. Quite comfortable for the hand, and kids love them. Um, and, and they serve, you know, a huge amount of uh, functional activity. So I find that even with my big compost bins, the large ones that I do, um, I can use this to work them, and you can work quite deep into the soil with them. So it's a lovely little tool, and in the case here where we would just want to make a hollow to plant the plant, you loosen the soil up, and then just create a cavity, and put our plant in, and then afterwards you can go around and you can put the soil back around again. So it's a lovely little tool, very simple little, little device. But the other thing is that we talked about the mushrooms and the fungi mm -hmm. in the soil. They Now we're starting to realise that they're more important than we ever realised. And when you have a lot of twigs and sticks in there, mm -hmm. that's what they feed on. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of the fungi type growth development in, in your soil, which is really quite interesting. And that's why it's good to have twigs and sticks twigs in there. Twigs and sticks in there, yeah. yeah the only yeah. part of it is if you have too much, yeah. what it tends to do is it tends to use nitrogen up. Okay. So yeah. if you have a little bit too much of it, yep. particularly in the topsoil where the roots are working, it'll start to plant nitrogen. Okay. So you could put um, coffee grounds. Coffee grounds is great. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and your animal fertilizer is usually high in nitrogen as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, so these, these um, we'll be selling packs of these, and you can put mm -hmm. these into your conventional compost bin. So. If you've got an ordinary oh, okay. Gettys compost bin, compost yeah. bin yeah. you can use the same thing. You just use one down the side, yeah, and then you just keep placing these in as you go. The and it just ensures that you get plenty of yeah. uh, air going through. They, they dramatically improve your compost. Yeah. They, they just shift the speed. Something so small. Yeah, really <laughs> simple. And when, you, when you're actually growing in a pot, so 
here's an example of one that say I just want to grow a plant in a pop on the veranda. Right. So I've got one here and I've, I've drilled my hole, so I've made one that's low down and I've made the hole a nice tight fit that I can put a piece of hose in it and I can put this up on bricks and I can catch the water that runs off here. But what I do is I put these holes up a little bit higher. Mm. When you're growing in pots, the thing that really traps you is if you get stagnant water sitting in the bottom, mm -hmm. that's where you run the risk of disease coming in. Yeah, and we're Biochar becomes a wonderful material to use in the bottom of your growing pot. Okay. Because it has the ability to hold microbes and a lot of the living organisms that will control a lot of that. Because most of the disease in that comes from an anaerobic situation. Mm -hmm. But the biochar allows there to be enough air movement around it, enough drainage through it, the bulk of the water will grow, grow off. Yep. And the bacteria, the air-driven bacteria, will control and dominate the bottom of the pot. So what I'll, I'll do is I'll put just a, a small layer of biochar in the bottom. As I say, you can make this yourself. So you yep. can see there that just put a short, small layer in there. Yep. So I can see that. And then what I'll do is I'll start building up a layer of um, soil. Now, this is in a situation where uh, previously we were just going to grow in our compost bin after we made our compost. So we've got pots around and we can make our compost in that. But in this case, um, we can take some soil. If we want to, we can mix some biochar in with it because we said that biochar will actually increase the amount of... Um, Water nice yeah. So it's about four times an increase. So it's sort of um, like coconut fibre and that's Yeah, it's, it's very much like coconut fibre. Uh, and it's carbon, carbon based. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't reduce its volume, it stays the same. Then you need to mix some fertiliser in with your soil. Yeah. biochar. What we've been doing is I've, I've been collecting um, coffee grounds from the majors, mm -hmm. rabbit poo, all those sorts of materials, so any of your preferred fertilisers. And then you just mix that all in together and I mix it with sheep manure. It's okay. an incredibly good combination with sheep manure. Mm -hmm. Mixing the soils up really well is really a good idea, that's why I like a big container where you can really get into it mm -hmm. and accurately mix it all through. You can actually, believe it or not, grow vegetables in straight biochar. So um, there's a couple of really clever little tricks you can do when you're growing in pots. Mm -hmm. Plants tend to get root bound, so the most important thing is disease from stagnating water. Right, yes. So we use the biofuel cell in our pots, mm -hmm. and what you do is you run it down the side of the pot, Yes. and I'll run it down so it lines up close to a hole. Okay. And it doesn't have to be right on the hole because the air will move across to wherever it, wherever it is. So I'll just put that down to the bottom. And what that's doing is it's ensuring that plenty of oxygen is getting into the surround of the pot. Um, the reason that roots of plants grow in top soil is because there's more oxygen in the top layer of soil. And as you get further down, there's less oxygen. So oxygen stimulates root growth. But if you have too much oxygen, it will actually burn the roots off. Right. So what some clever people have come up with is they've realised that if you drill holes in your pot, you stop the plants from becoming root bound. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you get a little, like a three millimetre, four millimetre drill, and you just make a hole pattern. I mean, this is quite time consuming, but for somebody who loves knitting, you'll find this is not too bad. <laughs> and what you can do is you can actually bore holes around the whole of your pot. Right. And what happens is when the plant's roots start getting out, to the, the roots of the plants will love the edge of the plastic where there's plenty of oxygen, yeah. and they'll tend to want to grow to that area. Mm. And there's a lot of water building up on the side on the plastic, and so they get a lot to drink, a lot of nutrient loading. And what they do is they'll start to poke their root out through the hole, through the hole and as soon as it comes into a full layer of oxygen, it burns off. So you don't get any root binding right. in your oh, pot. Okay. Mm. So you, you don't take it out of the pot and find they're all around the No, and when you, you get that, that, that when you get the roots doing that, it's like trimming roots. Yeah. Um, I, I discovered that some time ago. I had fruit trees and I uh, dug a holes about the size of the 20 litre pail and put in fish. And where I cut the root of the tree, it would go into the fish and you get a ball of root forming. And it just re restored. We had trees that were virtually not 
doing any oh, no production, okay. they, were, yeah. they were dying virtually. Mm -hmm. And we just put in these single tubs of fish, one on each plant. And the next year we had a flush of fruit on the trees. Okay. Yeah. So um, root pruning is really interesting. There's, mm -hmm. a whole, there's a whole lot of new information coming up about that. People are looking at it more closely. Um, so that, they, these are just little handy tricks that you can learn. So you can actually make that so that you'll get a lot more um, vigour in your plant. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you, you take your soil and you just fill your pot to the required height. Great for growing plants on the balcony. In a tub this size, you can grow. Um, if, you, if you go on to YouTube and have a look at some of the tomatoes that people yeah, grow, yeah, I was going to say tomatoes, uh, yeah. peas, snow peas. Yeah. Um, I think the record for one tomato plant is about 400 pounds of tomato, and and you can grow them in a tub this size. So there we have it, and what you would do is you'd now wet that soil all the way through and make sure that it's nice and evenly moistened. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I um, put a little plastic container, poke a small hole in the bottom of it, make a little depression for it. Irrigation system. That's my irrigation system. And I've got a community garden that I only get to about once every two or three weeks, and I actually use a 100 mil piece of pipe. Right. And about um, 400 millimetres long. And when I water, I just fill that tube. Yeah. And the other thing about watering the, the base of your, but the water and the soil underneath is that you get really full form fruit. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's really interesting is everybody waters with just tap water. So you shouldn't use any chlorine in your water. Mm. Preferable to use rain water and natural water. Yeah. And the other thing is you shouldn't just use clean water. Mm. You should always put a little impurity in your water. Mm. So a little bit of um, runoff from your worm farm. Or just put a little bit of fertiliser yeah. in your water, but it's, mm. it's all, your plants do a lot better if you don't use just pure water. Because mm -hmm. in nature they, they usually have runoff and there's yeah. liquid coming yeah. off the leaves and all mm. that sort of thing. And then what I do is I take some of my compost that I've made, or the, um, the, the tree mulch, yeah. and I spread that round the top. The top. And that's to keep the moisture in. That keeps the moisture in. About three to four inches. There's a, there's a wonderful program called Back to Eden, which, um, which uh, shows the, the amazing crops. And he just grows his vegetables in this. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't have anything other than just this and a bit of chicken manure. Mm. And he grows the most wonderful, wonderful vegetables. So you can have that up to about three or four inches deep. Yeah. And then create. You actually put the roots of the plant because this is this actually will steal nitrogen still because it's got a lot of carbon in it. Right. And it's got okay, a lot of wood so chip that's unbroken down. So you don't want your roots yeah. in this area. Yeah. And what I do is when I come to do my next planting, I scrape this off the soil and I keep this. This is precious for me. Yeah. Because it stops me having to water the garden yeah, and lose water and weeding it. and all that mm. sort of thing. So then you just create your cavity in the middle, mm. plant your plant, and then sprinkle this back around the top. And the other thing that I've been doing lately is I've been using, uh, getting any bits of old copper that I can get, because I'm tired of losing um, seedlings to snails. Ah. Oh. So I just get a... They don't uh, like coffee grounds. They don't like coffee grounds. That's the other thing, if you're using coffee grounds in your fertiliser. Yeah. And also you can just use old bits of copper, but they need to be like copper tube or copper ribbon. You can right. buy it. It's quite expensive to buy. Oh, I was going to say copper's expensive these days. Yes, yeah. but often, you know, I pick it up off the side of the road just rubbish collections yeah. and you know you, you find bits of copper mm. around it's handy to have and you know you can use it over and over again mm. but it's uh, fantastic because I don't lose any, any plants to snails yeah. and slugs. They also don't like broken up um, eggshells. I've tried that and I've not had a lot of success with oh, it. Oh okay. Um, I haven't quite mastered that art yet. Uh, yeah. But this one I know is absolutely dynamic okay. it just knocks them over dead. So um, just recapping on that, you know, make up some good fertiliser, mm -hmm. mix it in with your soil, and there you've got your pot and you can actually have this up on 
block so that you've got room so to put a container underneath, underneath your and you can have a container run. underneath where you collect the liquid. Yep. And typically I don't necessarily put that back in the garden. Right. I might put that back into my compost bin or something like that or put it around a shrub. Another garden bed. Yeah, another garden bed. So I, I don't recycle, not like hydroponics where you're putting it back through. Just in case you've got any um, any things that are starting to build up mm -hmm. on the way through, okay. you're not contaminating this all back here. Yeah. Yeah. So there we have it. That's the so biofuel that's story. Is, yeah. Okay. So what's going to be available, um, we're just having these made at the moment, so they're going to become available and we'll sell them probably in packs of 10. Mm -hmm. So you can use them in your plants, any okay. pots at all, you can cut yep. them up to length and use them in small pots. Right. And yep. what about the ones that go along yep. on your use, layers? Use the you same can use unit the same thing and you just cut layers. them to length okay. for what you want. Mm. And so you can use them even if your bin is really deep, mm. you just use them to that depth and you place another one on top. On top. And they don't actually have to go right across the bin. So if your bin's this wide, yeah. they don't have to go all the way across. You put one there and then one. You can put another one on the other side and stagger them. Mm -hmm. mm. So there we go. Okay. So as so long as you've got the drainage tube. Yep. And the bits down the bottom. Yep. So we can recycle through. Okay. Easy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you for coming along. <laughs> Thank you. It just seems too easy, doesn't it? it, it it's stupidly simple. Mm. But the difference it makes is, yeah. is quite dramatic. Mm. I've, I've been staggered. I, I mean, I, I have um, containers that are maybe, um, maybe that wide and that high. Mm. And the speed with which it breaks down is just extraordinary. And what, what you find happens is because you've, we still film. Because you've got these, what, what happens when you open these up, and I'll show you on the coarser one, what happens is the worms just yeah. love these things because yeah. there's a lot of water forms around them. And when you pull these out, sometimes I've pulled them out and, and it's just... full of worms. You lift it up like that and it's just, the worms are pouring out of the holes <laughs> and hanging out of it. And um, the other thing that you f you'll find is, like I can fill because we use a lot of, you know, we grow our own vegetables and everything, we have a lot of kitchen scraps and mm -hmm. a lot of veggie scraps out of the garden. And I can fill a container quite quickly. Yeah. And what I find is when I go and break it down, I'll end up with worms from top to bottom. Because in your worm farm, what happens is the, the worms are driven by oxygen as well. They go down as low as 2% oxygen. Okay. But when your material is well fed with oxygen, the bacteria are functioning very well, and the worms are actually living off that bacteria and all of those other organisms that are in there. So if if your unit at the bottom is working really well, yeah. and it's got plenty of air flowing through it, the worms will stay there. Right. But normally when you make a worm farm, you only feed it with up. a tiny bit of material yeah. on the top. Oh. And you have to wait until they've eaten that until right. you put more on. Yeah. But with this, I just keep layering right. it up. Yeah. And I'll have a layer, you know, I'll have one that'll be a metre high or even higher. And there will be worms from top to bottom. Mm. Solid tub of worms. So that, that it really is an efficient um, system, just such a simple little thing. But what we're actually doing is I think of it as like a, an apartment house. Mm. So you've got the same system as what nature likes, which is the little thin layers with really good oxygenation. Yeah. And this oxygen comes up right That's the way through. So you don't have to go out and buy composting um, yeah, worm farm. No, I... I um, They're just what's come up from the ground. What's come up from the ground. And you can swap with your neighbours too. If your neighbours have got composting worms and you want to, yeah. you know, you can mix and match. Yeah. And, um, and, and they breed really quickly. And because you're using it in the garden, you find that when you put one over here, yeah. the worms will start to lose their food from there. And they actually travel through the yeah. ground and they'll yeah. find they'll it. Find it's it, quite yeah. incredible how they find yeah. these things. And uh, you, you just put a pile of material on the ground and <laughs> next minute there's worms in it. And the thing that always fascinates me is the guttering. You know, how do the worms get up in the gutter? Huh. And every time we go to clean my gutter, it's full of worms. The only thing I can think of is the blackbirds go up there with a beak full of worms and they can't hold them all, and some of them wriggle out. Oh, I think they probably go up through your drain pipes. Probably, yeah. Mm. yeah. So it's pretty amazing where they get to. Mm. Okay. Okay. I'll show you another little thing which we don't need to put on film because we put it on last time. Okay, I might as well. Okay. Yep. Um, 
the, the, the latest discussion is, is about um, um, compost tea is really becoming very, very fashionable and, and very um, efficient. Right. And there are some people that are some very high-end scientists who are able to convert from synthetic gardening to organic gardening just mm -hmm. using compost tea and overcoming a lot of the disease problems. And there's, there's a number of people that are doing this sort of work. And modern science is now really giving us a close picture of what's actually happening. Yeah. And they now, mushrooms now have their own kingdom, like we have an animal kingdom and mm -hmm. all the different kingdoms we have. Well, there's now a mushroom kingdom, and that happened about 10 or 12 years ago. Because there's so many varieties? Well, there's one mushroom that's, I think, that at the moment they've got uh, 90 hectares or 1,000 hectares or something, and it's just one mushroom. And they can actually see it from high altitudes. And what it, it's so big yeah. that there's not enough nutrient in the ground to feed it. So what it does is it, it dies off in places and it creates its own, from its own body tissue, it creates its, its own, own nutrient. Yeah. Yeah. And it keeps growing and it just continues growing. But what happens with... The, the mushroom spores, you'll see those white little trails and often your compost goes quite white mm. when you open it up. Mm. Well, that's the mycelium and that's the roots of the mushroom. And these mycelium can get very, very thin yeah. and they travel right through the clay and they go very deep into the clay mm. and into the deep layers of, of the soil, below the, below the topsoil and the subsoil. And they carry up with them the trace elements that are down there. And the root of the plant from the tree comes down and they've got a language and the language is a chemical language. So these roots are giving off a chemical trace like an odour yeah. and it, it's got certain characteristics in its chemical makeup and it's giving it off. And this mycelium will travel along here and it, there'll be a root over there that's giving off a, a signal that it doesn't particularly fancy. It doesn't have a particular attraction to that. Mm. So it'll go past it. Yeah. And then it'll find another root that's giving off the right signal. Mm. So if we, if we blow the size of the root up, and the root's made up of cells, and the cells go in and they've got a, an outer layer, like we have a skin on the outside, and there's little breaches in there that go down, and you can actually work your way through. So the mycelium will travel along, and it'll wrap around the root that's giving off the signals that it wants, and it'll travel along until it finds a breach, and it'll go down and it'll sit in a cell, usually about three cells deep into that root, that plant. And it'll sit in the middle of that cell and it'll give off its trace elements and it'll pick up the, um, the sugars that are coming down from the sun, from the, the photosynthesis and the leaf yeah. of the plant. Yeah. And that's what it uses to feed its body and structure. Yeah. And so there's this exchange going on. And is that like the truffles as well? Yeah, truffles. All, everything is totally dependent. All, mm. all. Um, this is this is why the organic state of soil is so important. Yeah. And this is going on all the time. Yeah. And um, some of the gum trees are totally dependent on certain varieties of mushroom. But without them, they can't they, they yeah. can't grow. Yeah. So when they uh, when they take them out, they've got to have that that um, that soil condition and that type of um, that type of interaction has got to go on in the soil for them to survive. But it's incredible how you know how the how nature works out these amazingly wonderful things, and they're all happening on a little level, you know. There, and that's why I really like the biofuel cell because it's coming back to, you know, it's working in a physical geographical area, and it's creating the perfect condition all the way through your bin. So it's not just water being poured on yeah. the top. Yeah. Because when you pour water on the top. Or, or turn it, you get air for a short period of time, then it runs they're, out. They're complex. Yeah. So this one is yeah. keeping it in a constant state, yeah. and the heat is causing that to rise and draw the air mm. through it. Yeah. So really simple concept, but when you work with it, you see how efficient yeah. it is. And I can get my bins. I, I have um, cubic meter bins, and I get my coffee grounds, and I have some mm. horse manure and some lawn clippings, and it's like a hot plate. And I yeah. can keep it really, really, really hot. hot. Yeah. And then I'll bring out kitchen scraps and put yeah. it in a hole in the middle. And it'll disappear in about a week. Mm. And then all the worms sort of accumulate on the outer walls where it's colder. And then just close it down and then I come back and I've got this beautiful, you know, six months later I've got this beautiful pile of lovely rich compost. Okay. Um, so the other, the other thing about termites, which a lot of people don't know, is that Victoria wasn't a, before the white man came, mm. there wasn't a lot of worms here. Right. And 
you need to have holes bored in the ground to get mm. the oxygen down to the roots and to let the whole thing work. And termites serve that function. Right. So the forests here mm. had massive, and that's why we've got so much um, termite, termite activity. Yeah. But what happens is the termites go down and they did a study, they actually did a scientific study and they tested the comparison of termites in the ground mm -hmm. as opposed to worms. Yes. Because the worm, when he goes down through the soil, he has a little filament that he, or a, a liquid that he gives off. Right. And it's very high nitrogen and the roots tend to trace that down and follow it down. And the termites have a similar thing, they, they infuse nitrogen into the soil. Mm -hmm. And isn't that interesting, you know, that, yeah, that, I didn't that realize they, yeah. a lot of people don't know that. No. So we didn't have a, a worm system. A big worm system. Yeah. And I thought, well, they look at Karambara. Yeah. I thought they yeah. had worms. Well, it would, have been, it would have been varieties of worms, yeah, but it wasn't yeah. like, because most of the worms we've got here now have come from from, from, from Britain and Europe, yeah. um, where they're the, you know, the more the, the faster acting worms, yeah, the compost, compost worms that we talk about. Yeah, that's it. So, um, you don't need anything on, like when you're making the compost, do you put hessian or anything on the top of it? Um, you, if it's heavy rain, you yeah. don't want it to get too wet. Yep. So you can put a cover over the top. Mm -hmm. um, but it's sometimes rain is good, you know, you can just monitor it and that's one of those adjustments. I've heard people putting um, dog poo and cat poo in compost, yep. but then someone said you can't do it if they've been wound. The, pets have been the, the issue is that if you're going to use your compost, yes. uh, it's a little bit tricky using um, animal facial material. For the food you're going to eat. For the food you're going to eat. You're yeah. better to actually set up a compost bin like the ones that go below the ground and just yeah. use it as a disposal system. Oh, yeah. um, because that's that's much better. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then it, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So you're better to use the below ground systems for anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, with the kitchen scraps, I put um, just your general kitchen scraps because usually you don't have too much meat or yeah, um, leftovers. leftovers, so it, it's a reasonable yeah. balance. And I put just everything in. I mm. find that you know the whole lot goes and breaks down. Yours. And all, all of this is about your own recipe and your own mm. preference. Mm. There's nobody dictating mm. to you what you have to do or mm. don't do. Some people don't want to put meat in their bins. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I, I use meat in mine. I don't have a problem with it. Mm because I'm not turning it, because I'm not handling it, mm. I'm not exposed and it's got plenty of time to mature. Sort of thing, yeah. So it's left for about 12 months and it, mm. you know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, seem to create any problems. Yeah. So the idea of this is to encourage people in, you know, topsoil we've destroyed trillions and trillions of tonnes of topsoil and just ends up in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And it's our responsibility, really, everybody should be making topsoil because that's the future of our feeding of our planet, teaching our kids how to do it. So what I'm doing with this, and you know, we're initiating through community houses, and what we want to do is to make these products available and see if we can disseminate it out through you know, the workshops like this and get other people going on it and have it as a project. And we've actually set up a little community garden out the front. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that actually, when I made it up, uh, when you do these big tubs, it takes a lot of soil to fill those big apple boxes and that people use. So we've got this version, which is the you know the small packable and freightable. We're going to produce that and be able to try and sell that all around the world because these freight is a bit hard to transport. And um, the growing concept, and so we, we, we want to um, bring it up from ground roots and workshops like this and start you know getting. And it's really just flowing into the, the existing mm -hmm. permaculture and all the other things that are out there. But it's, it's really mainly focusing on putting it in the garden so that you don't have your compost bin on your lawn, you have it in your veggie garden so you're feeding the worms and keeping that whole cycle going together. The ability to use any container that you put your hands on to be resourceful and creative and children can decorate them and you know, you've got a whole world of stuff that can go on with it. And then coming into balcony growing and just to recap that the importance of char, biochar we will see as we move into the future is just, and it's carbon sequestration, so that carbon is stored in there. It lasts for, you know, that they've got some of the carbon you know, that they found in South America that's almost from the original fires that was first formed, you know, some of the parts that they found that archaeologically they've gone back and studied it. So that's my story.
because you have that thing that everybody wants to grow in their garden and it's fantastic and we've got to keep doing that. But at the same time you want that little window where you know that something has really not got any le leftover chemicals from the previous owners and all that sort of stuff. You want to know what's going on. So you can have your balcony gardens with this concept of the, mm. the charcoal which is really very um, sterile. And then you can have um, another layer where you go and make your own compost because your compost is quite sterile. You know, it's 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 it got a balancing. Yeah. And the longer you leave it, if you leave it for twelve months, those those and, and have it well aerated, those balancing acts that take place. There's a chap that grows um, giant tomatoes and he wins all the Guinness Book of Records and he's done I think three hundred and forty pounds of tomatoes on one tomato and it's just done in ordinary soil and you can do them in a tub like this. And, and it's just done by just um, uh, very good hygiene. He's right into hygiene. He says, hygiene is number one. Um, you shouldn't let your tomatoes get below 10 degrees at any stage of their growth. They shouldn't go below that. It can cause a little bit of an adverse um, reaction. And then he prunes them so they go up and they have two trusses and then he lets them go to four. And he ends up with 19 trusses. And he's grown them 27 feet high and just pumping, absolutely laden with fruit. So just to go back on these two units there, because yep. there, there's something you could be composting and take the compost out and spread it into yeah. the other garden. Well, you can do that. Then. Or you could just grow things in there. You just grow them. The idea of it is that we are we are not disturbing all that colony of bacteria yeah. and so forth. So you could just start one of these and then just let it settle. But the important thing also is actually because it's got no boss, it's actually feeding the ground as well. And what happens is the worms actually, the worms move in the soil a lot. That's how you can grow on the outside around it. You'll find your, you'll find your growing cycle will grow, yeah. you know, your, everything close to the yeah. tub will grow. And yeah. this isn't interrupting too much of the light, you know, you can actually get light going around. Yeah. And you can do some tricky things, you can actually put uh, alfoil on that and actually increase the light into your garden. Mm -hmm. and reflection mm -hmm. from it. Also. The other thing when you're making the compost, you can actually start to feel the warmth coming through the container so you can get a bit of an idea of what cycle they're at by the temperature that's coming out through the side of the container. Is it good to keep that in the sun? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And, and these are good to have the lids to the ground. So you can keep them good contained. And if you take your worm wee, you know, you're collecting, uh, yeah. when you've got the compost been working well and got a great, because these will just have balls and balls of worms in them. And you can keep putting your old compost in. You can have three or four of these bins at different stages. You've got lots of worms here. And this one's starting to get, you can put a bit of that in there to keep that going along so you can work them together. Then you can take these out, put them on a balcony and have a, a garden, or you can put them back into the soil. So you've got so many different ways you can use it. There's, there's more, well, there's more trace elements and minerals and goodies left in the coffee grounds than there is in the coffee you drink. <laughs> Most of the toxic, you know, neurotoxins and all the other stuff that we don't like to think about are in the water that we trade off. Right. And the real good stuff is in the coffee grounds. And the other thing that happens is um, caffeine is uh, highly toxic to white butterfly and snails. Yes, well, well when, when you're making it into your compost like this, you, and it is also gives off gas, which the white butterfly... The other thing that's really fantastic is banana skins. Whole bananas mushed up in your juicer. Made into a spray and, and for a white fly, and quite a number of other things, and, and also high potassium, so it's nutrient loading in your, your garden as well. Yeah, this leaf material, you know, the bottom can be filled with wood chips and be making soil mm. all the time. Now, I bought some of the material <laughs> that I made earlier, <laughs> yeah. which is um, now this is the, that wood chip that you saw. Yeah. So this one here we've got called the gum leaf. And we go around and we get that gum leaf from, um, yeah. with as much leaf as we possibly can in it. Mix that with horse manure or coffee grounds or whatever and get it up hot. Lawn clippings is fantastic. Mm. Lawn clippings is really, really great. And, and just mix it together and build it up in piles. Use the same principle. Mm -hmm. Make sure you get the air flowing. And with the wood chip, you've got all the wood chip in there. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of this is if you've got a reasonable amount of wood chip in it, it won't sink down too far. And as you were talking about the tan bark and with the all these mm. char and they they make incredibly good sponges because they hold structure mm. so they don't shrink and they have porosity in their structure so that they can store the water and the microbes love living on them because they've got cages where they've got oxygen feed, water, bacteria will grow in there and it creates its own living colonies. So 
what this is, is this is that material after probably about three or four months. And what I do with this material is I put it on the top of my garden. So mm -hmm. I just put it on the top of the plant. You know, I can use old polystyrene boxes, mm -hmm. coat them with a bit of render, you know, mm -hmm. and polystyrene boxes are fantastic for winter growing because they keep the warmth in the soil. Yeah, and I'll only put two or three inches of that, or, you know, you put up to three or four inches on top. And what that does is it stops the sunlight getting into the top soil and it means that your soil is really protected underneath and you, you stop your weed growth and all of that with that material. So that, that's a really nice integrated system. And uh, we'll be creating a face page with this so yeah, we can get in touch with us. And, um, yeah. and as we get rolling along, we'll, we'll start doing regular things when we get a network of people starting mm, to follow and, doing and, it, and yeah. turn it into a bit of a gardening club. You know, mm. where we can actually swap notes and, yep. and start to uh, share more knowledge. Yeah, no, this is a great thing for community gardening. And like I said, people who don't ha live in units and don't have backyards yep. can grow things in tubs and, yes. yeah, yeah. and can compost. Because a lot of the time people say, what's the point in making compost? I, I don't grow anything, you know, or I, I don't know what to do. So, yeah. you know, having something like that where you can actually just make it in a tub and you can turn it into something useful. Yeah. And there's not much work with it. Thanks, Mike. That was a great presentation. <laughs>